Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Saturday, everybody. It's the weekend, so we start with foreign policy and geopolitical developments. Yesterday, Friday, the leaders of the United States, Japan, and South Korea held a summit at the U.S. presidential retreat in Camp David, the first standalone meeting among the three countries. In a joint statement, the three nations said that they opposed China's quote dangerous and aggressive behavior end quote in maritime disputes in the East and South China Seas. And committed to hold regular joint exercises, consult each other during crises, share real-time intelligence, and hold summits every year. This is a very significant development. Some commentators are even calling it a diplomatic coup for the U.S. At the very least, it's a sign of how concerned the ruling elite in Seoul and Tokyo view China and North Korea, and a powerful reminder for the world. About just how dangerous the geopolitical environment in Asia is becoming, and despite a historically divided Washington, there is one area with robust bipartisan consensus. Quote: The security situation in the region has worsened, with Beijing's massive military buildup, expansive territorial claims, and threatening behavior toward Taiwan and its neighbors, as well as the growing nuclear and missile threat posed by its ally North Korea. The risks of war in Asia. Have become acute. End quote. South Korea and Japan are neighbors and established U.S. allies, but the legacy of the period of Japanese imperialism has cast a long shadow over bilateral relations, much to the frustration of a Washington seeking greater cooperation between the two. However, it seems that the old truism, "The enemy of my enemy is my friend," may be bringing South Korea and Japan closer. With U.S. President Biden praising the quote political courage end quote of the South Korean and Japanese leaders, South Korea's Yoon called the event a quote historic day end quote. Dennis Wilder, who managed the Japan and South Korea relationship during the George W. Bush era, called the development quote mind blowing end quote, adding in a post on Twitter that during his time in office, the U.S. could quote barely get South Korean and Japanese leaders to meet us in the same room end quote. We should note, however, bilateral relations between Japan and South Korea remain deeply complex. And susceptible to periods of volatility, which, if mismanaged, could derail Washington's plans for greater trilateral military, diplomatic, and intelligence cooperation. Quote, Tensions that run deep, particularly in South Korea, due to past historical animosities related to Japan's colonization of Korea, do not disappear overnight, and we are likely to continue to see diplomatic spats arise. Relatively low approval ratings for Kishida and Yoon back home may limit the amount of diplomatic capital the two leaders could sink into Korea-Japan relations. End quote. Friday's Camp David meeting wasn't the only development in this space. Earlier this week, we learned too that the new trilateral alliance will enhance cooperation among the U.S., South Korea, and Japan in key areas, including ballistic missile defenses, has been achieved. Intelligence sharing, supply chains, and cybersecurity were also included in the agreement. In addition, it was reported that the three countries had agreed to establish a leader-level hotline. Of course, Beijing, which as recently as a month ago hosted its own trilateral talks with its Asian neighbors, and controversially, through the comments of top diplomat Wang Yi, even called on the three to embrace racial solidarity, to push back against the yellow-haired and sharp-nosed Westerners. Is not happy about any of these developments. State media, led by the Global Times, published a series of articles this week in the lead-up to the Friday meeting in both Chinese and English. A brief sampling of the few should give us a taste of the key themes and ideas. Quote, the various pieces of information related beforehand indicate that the tri-country summit will sound the trumpet for moving into the new Cold War. This is an ominous signal. For Northeast Asia and even the world, the Korean Peninsula issue is a legacy of the Cold War. This is not a historical coincidence. Behind it lies a hidden hand stretching over from across the Pacific, manipulating events in the shadows. End quote. 
And, quote, the three countries are expected to reach a consensus on a trilateral security alliance at the summit and gradually form a mini NATO security mechanism for Northeast Asia via specific defense technology sharing and joint military exercises. This mini NATO mechanism indeed capitalizes on concerns stemming from missile and nuclear threats on the Korean Peninsula. But the design of the mechanism is not aimed at resolving the existing security dilemma in Northeast Asia. Instead, it seeks to exploit the existing security challenges to establish an alliance framework that would dominate the regional security agenda, which reflects U.S.'s destructive intentions. End quote. On Thursday, the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs spokesperson Wang Wenbin expressed that Beijing, quote, opposes the practice of intensifying confrontation and harming the strategic security of other countries. End quote. This week, speaking at the U.S.-based Brookings Institution and responding to a question about China's concerns that the U.S. is setting up a mini-Asia NATO against China, Kurt Campbell, Biden's top Indo-Pacific advisor, expressed that, quote, they, Japan and South Korea, feel in many respects under unimaginable pressure, huge pressures economically, diplomatically, and militarily, end quote, adding that the countries in the region, quote, have prospered over the past half century and don't want to see the order upended. End quote. We are certainly living in interesting times. Next up, Evergrande declares bankruptcy and the housing crisis. Hey everyone, if you enjoyed today's episode of China Update, don't forget to hit that like button. Liking, sharing, subscribing are all huge helps, especially sharing with people who you think would enjoy this sort of content. And for anyone who can go the extra mile and help me keep the channel financially sustainable, Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are in the description below. Thank you so much everybody for the ongoing support. On Thursday, China Evergrande Group sought Chapter 15 bankruptcy protection in New York. The real estate giant's move protects it from creditors in the U.S. while it works on a restructuring deal elsewhere. The petition would apply to restructurings being carried out in Hong Kong and the Cayman Islands. While this is a notable development, it's a fairly routine move too. International debt restructuring deals sometimes require a Chapter 15 filing in the course of finalizing a transaction, and the market is already well aware of the poor state that Evergrande is in. While Evergrande's fate is important, there are other major players we need to follow too, like Country Garden and financial conglomerate Zhongzhi Enterprise Group Co., these two could also have broad implications for China's 60 trillion US dollar financial system. Country Garden Holdings Co., once China's biggest developer, is nearing a possible first default, and the massive Zhongzhi Enterprise Group, heavily exposed to real estate assets, has reportedly stopped paying on dozens of trust and investment products. Evergrande first defaulted on a dollar bond in December 2021, following months of uncertainty about its finances. Meanwhile, UK-based Financial Times writes that China's state-owned property developers are warning themselves of widespread losses. Quote, Fueling concerns that the housing crisis is expanding from the private sector to companies with government backing. End quote. UK-based Reuters reports of similar concerns. According to corporate filings, 18 of the 38 state-owned enterprise builders listed in Hong Kong and the Chinese mainland reported preliminary losses in the six months ended June 30th, up from 11 that warned of full-year losses in 2022. Two years ago, only four firms posted losses. Quote, China's property slowdown is already hurting all developers, including the large government-linked ones. We do not expect the situation to materially improve in the second half, end quote. And finally for the housing crisis and today's video, in an article called China Housing Slump Worse Than Official Data, U.S. financial media outlet Bloomberg claims that while officially new home prices have slipped just 2.4 percent from a high in August of 2021, quote, the picture emerging from property agents and private data providers is far more dire, end quote. These figures show existing home prices falling, quote, at least 15 percent in prime neighborhoods of major metropolitan areas like Shanghai and Shenzhen, as well as in more than half of China's Tier 2 and Tier 3 cities. 
Existing homes near Alibaba Group Holding Limited's headquarters in Hangzhou have dropped about 25% from late 2021 highs. End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. I hope you all have a wonderful Saturday. I hope you have a restful weekend. And I will see you all again on Monday.